<laughs> I played some Todd Edwards classics. How was I saw that? You're killing it. Oh, hey, you say that to all the guys. No, that was fun. I love your, I love your songs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wow, this is like a total. Are we on? Wait, are we yeah, on? Are we, we on? Are we on? Oh, we are yeah, on. Okay. We are on. This is this is the uh, real. One wait, wait. I hope this is gonna. I'm gonna like listen to like you'll have it recorded because I've had to like uh, duck in and out because I'm working on something that's due. So I've been in the studio kind of doing my thing. What are you working on? Are you allowed to tell us? Oh, you know. Um, well, I mean, you know, the my back catalog from the I Records days is coming out in April on Defected Records. But I also did. Uh, I'm doing a new single called Angel that's coming out. So I'm just kind of. Oh bouncing out the stems for final mix down and it's due Monday. So I have to get it done. Okay. Well, in case people don't know, I'm going to introduce you, Todd. This is okay. you can introduce the man, me. Todd Edwards, a really rad guy. He sang on poolside song, um, getting there from here. I and can't remember the title that much either. So that's yeah, yeah. more importantly, he just sang on that last song fragments of time and mm -hmm. he sings on face to face. And is there any other Daft Punk songs you sing on? I don't, I don't no, know. No, just those two. Those so two. I'm but, actually lucky that I, I didn't expect to be asked back a second time to, to do something with them. So I was actually very honored that they asked me to, to do that. Well, and yes, Todd has a big career even before Daft Punk, that Daft Punk was inspired by your music to begin doing. We'll get into a little of that origin story. But yeah, and yeah. Todd has a great catalog of music on his own. It's not just Daft Punk related. Um, and yeah, he's a rad guy, and you are you are a rad guy, and here we thank are talking. You. So are you. So are you. Hey, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, this was like a crazy thing that Daft Punk broke up this week, and so yeah, I just thought like you, kn I was gonna do this tribute thing, and I was like, well, Todd's like buddies with them, like maybe we can just talk about you, you, your career, your relationship to Daft Punk, what they mean to you, I you know, just whatever. We can just chit chat and. My, it would be interesting to me, so I was hoping it'd be interesting to the people watching too. So yeah, I, no, I'm everything. I'm always happy to nerd out about music. So definitely, I was a, uh, I woke up to that uh, video. Uh, Cedric Curvet, who is the art guy, he's kind of like the silent third member of Daft Punk, uh, sent me the link, and then like I got a link, uh, a text from my manager, and another friend, and I was like, I wasn't shocked by it. You know, I don't know exactly, like, I haven't spoken to Tomas about what the actual reason for the official, you know, breakup was. You right. Know? Um, I've been curious myself, but yeah. Yeah, Please. me too. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure at one point, like, you know, we've been kind of like playing email tag during the year, but, you know, and I'm, you know, I know they're crazy busy, so I don't like try to like stay on top of that. But um, mm -hmm. the, the thing is, is I wasn't. I wasn't shocked. I mean, you know, after Ram, I think they, well, A, they took a break because, you know, it was an intense project for them to work on. It was, you know, they put a good solid two years of intense, you know, musical work on that. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they needed a break after that. But, you know, I, I mean, just talking about different projects uh, that Tomas has been involved in, um, they've always had two separate paths aside from what they did together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think certain things when you know lined up when they work together, but they have a lot of separate projects and different ideas of what they want to do creatively. So I wasn't shocked by right. the breakup. I just didn't. I, I still don't quite get. You know, to me, it's like I would leave it like an open-ended bookmark. But maybe they did it for personal reasons, just to to close. You know, close right. the the book on something. You know, better. Sure. You know, what do they say? What's the statement? Better to uh, burn out than fade away. Yeah, that's a Neil Young. Not that that really fully applies, but... Yeah, I think they've already... 28 years, but... <laughs> but for people who don't know, including me, like, what's the origin story? Like, you did you guys... Like, I heard they came to your house in New Jersey and you were living with your parents and, you know... For way too long, yes, I was living with my parents, yes. Hey, that's okay, Todd, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean that's a crazy story. So tell tell us about like how you guys actually met. If, if well, that's cool. They they reached out. They reached out before when before homework actually. That's it. Okay. And I, I I met up with them. It was me, my my former manager, uh, Tomas and Gimon. Gimon was very quiet. Tomas did most of the talking, and they were young. Um, I was really impressed with how business oriented Tomas already was because I mean. 
at 22, 23, I'm just freaking clueless, you know. So to hear this guy that's younger than that, you know, just seemed really organized and really just like structured and had an idea and was very confident. I was like, I wish I could be like that, <laughs> you know. Okay. Um, but they were talking about a potential collaboration and then, you know, they went silent and then Homer came out. So I kind of like thought they lost interest, but it was kind of cool because I presumptuously just checked out the teacher's track. I'm like, let me just listen to this just real quick. And I heard my name. So I'm like, all right, at least they know they still, you know, still on their mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then, then prior to discovery, uh, I got, a, you know, my management got a call that they wanted to, uh, to work with me, which was cool. And so they came to my house, you know, um, and I had my studio in my old bedroom upstairs in my parents' so this house. Is, this is your parents' house. So that part literally, literally, literally came to your house. Yeah, they came to they came to the the family house. So, uh -huh. and you know, it's kind of funny because my father's kind of a goofball. Like, he opened up like the before he they met them, he opens up the door. It's like, Polly and I'm like, no, 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 no. so. <laughs> Um, okay, okay. They, they 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 walked into the the studio when they, when we first started you know working and I, they kind of smiled but I was like is this adequate you know and they were very happy with what they saw so that was a good sign because I don't know I mean like you know they they very you know I don't I don't know what other producers you know especially people that have been put out a major album that hit, what, you year, know. what year is this this was it had to be ninety nine. 2000 because that's when you know we started okay. working together so okay okay um so yeah we just you know we we got together the first day and just hung out and just talked about things and you know uh then you know we talked about what we were going to do and so i basically sampled up like 70 samples you know because obviously they wanted me to do the chopping thing yeah and like, you know the next day <laughs> they came up they came in and they had some records and they sampled up about 70 samples too. So uh, we started there. Uh, Tomas pitched all the samples, you know, got them all kind of in the same key, which is different from the way I worked at the time. I just randomly threw things on, on keys and just worked it out as I went along, but they kind of organized first. Um, I, you know, I've said this before, I'm not the most alpha male in the studio. So I, uh, you know, it's like, I'm, you know, I, I, no matter who it was, I mean, it's in spite of Daft Punk, like, you know, it's like I started doing some stuff and like, I'm not sure if they're feeling it or whatever. So it's like, you know, I'm a little hesitant, whatever. And then I was like, had Thomas get on the keys and he was actually playing like samples, like more, more like me than I do me, you know? So it's just like, wow, he could really just kind of, you know, imitate me if he wanted to, you know? Right. Um, right. So, you know, so Guimond's chilling there on the, on the stage. He's got a folding chairs because he didn't even have like, you know, adequate furniture in the, the room. So, and, you know, it slowly started to take form. You know, I added some stuff and then Tomas added a lot of stuff. And, um, you know, I, the, the, the cool thing was is that a lot of the samples that I sampled were used because, you know, when you go to the, when people start to analyze the samples and stuff, I know which ones that I contributed right, right. to. So, and this um, is for face to face, to face to face. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just, yeah, this no, is on no. discovery. Yeah. Make um, it. So it was really cool. I mean, they kind of explained what they were trying to accomplish with the album, which was, you know, it blew me away because, like, again, a lot of people just love their music. And I am fascinated by the behind the scenes process that they went through because it's it's not just about making music. There's like this whole world that they created behind uh, Discovery and they pretty much did something similar in Ram. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's not just like, oh, let's put some tracks together and put an album out. It's like they had an idea that they were going to tell a story about two robots and it was going to be this live action film. And each, each song was going to be uh, a video in the film, you know? So, and, you know, originally they, you know, one of the concepts was, it was like, you know, uh, he was explaining how the opening title was going to be like very disco and like the very and the disco were going to come together and cross and, and write out discovery. I'm like, Ooh, and I get goosebumps thinking about like, you know, his, the way their minds work, you know? So, and then, um, you know, they had th this process about, it was almost like this suppressed machine. And, and some of the, by the way, some of the, uh, the ideas translated into the anime that they wound up doing, but it was basically kind of like this, like, oppressed group of robots that were just kind of stuck in the everyday machine of life and stuff. And then they rebelled. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 
I guess so the climax like story. Yeah. Like a story behind the album. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, so each, you know, even though you can appreciate each song, but it was all telling, it was all part of telling this big story, you know? Yeah. And uh, the point where face to face was going to come in was uh, at, like after the climax where the, this battle ensued and the protagonist, you know, fighting against the antagonist when the smoke clears, it was like going to be this big mirror and they realized that they've been fighting themselves the whole time. So the concept of face to face oh, kind of uh, took on a life okay. of just like, you know, so you realize that you're, you're battling yourself, you know? Yes. So um, the funny thing is the, the, the first time we worked together, they then flew me over and it was the first time I was out of the States because I never, you know, never went anywhere uh, mm -hmm. before that. And they flew me out business class, which was like spoiled me because like after that, yeah. it was like, I kind of worked my way back to the middle with economy plus, but uh, you know, but they were, they treated me like <laughs> family and royalty. You know, they put me up in the Tim hotel in, in Montmartre. I guess it's the section of Paris it's called. I knew nothing. Like I was just blown away that, and you know, they put me in the best room in this hotel that overlooked all of Paris. You had the Sacre Cure out one window and then you just saw the Eiffel Tower, right? That was like, just blown away. Uh, yeah. Wow. But the, um, what's, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Oh yeah. Who wouldn't be? Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, I, um, but the thing is, is um, when we got there, we really didn't like, I was there for two weeks, but we really didn't work. Um, we just kind of listened to it and said, okay, that's good. And then they just kind of like, you know, took me around like at the time, Pedro Winters was their manager. So I got to know him and he was usually driving me around. You know, he was a good kid. Now look at him, you know, it's like yeah. a bang of records. Um, was he still that tall back then? He he was very tall back then as well. Yes, yeah. But it was funny because him and DJ Falcon were kind of a comedy act. Like when we got together and hung out, they were just like they, they just vibed off of each other. It's really funny. But the one thing that Tomas said at one point when, you know, during that first trip, he's like, you know, I noticed in the studio that you held back. And I'm like, and I kind of explained to him, like, well, you know, I'm a little hesitant. I don't know what you were vibing off of it. So I felt like I didn't do enough, you know? I mean, I'm, the samples were there, but I felt like I didn't participate enough. So the second trip uh, was like, I think about six months later or so, um, I decided I wanted to take a stab at writing face to face, like, you know, with this, because basically the whole face to face was off of a, a sample that sounded like saying face to face, it's actually saying Christopher Roberts. Um, okay. <laughs> so, but anyway, so I wrote the song to kind of fit the, the, the film that they were coming up with. So it was like something, I, I wanted it to fit three criteria um, that you could sing it to somebody, like you were actually dealing with someone in conflict. You could sing it to yourself as if you were just looking in that mirror that they set up as the, you know, the, the after the climax. And then I was very spiritual, religious at the time. So I also wanted to make it something like if you were talking to God. So it had to fit like those three things. And, and it worked out. I did a, a test run singing it for them and they really liked it. So they winded up recording me and literally just recorded me twice. What you hear on the finished product. Uh, mm -hmm. is basically just me singing twice. They didn't even auto-tune it. That was, that was really? it. Tomas, Tomas directed me. He's very good with that. Okay. Um, if your dog has something to say, you should just bring yes. it Yes, Snoring is like not up. <laughs> no, <it's> not <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's amazing. That's, this is how real we are right now. I know. I know. I know. I wish I could have a dog. Um, yeah. What's up, bud? Um, um, well, that's, well, that's... I mean, that story is serious. Like... like unbelievable in a certain way i mean yeah yeah, um, yeah. and then well, the funny on, thing is is like i said tomas was the one that I, I don't really have one set voice because i can right, do like right. impersonations and i can alter my voice so i when i was first singing it it was kind of na really nasally and he okay. was like can you sing it more like foreigner like the group foreigner like so more of a rock vocal so i made it more raspy okay and okay. uh you know that's that's how i molded my voice to be like that you know, yeah, it's, yeah, that's one of my favorite Daft Punk songs by you, and and yeah, I agree. Your voice, like now that I know you, we've been around it. Yeah, yeah. Like, were you? But when we first met, I was like, hey, you sing that? Like, it was <laughs> yeah. a lot of people didn't realize it was me because they yeah, didn't. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't shown as a featured, you know, singer on there. So mm -hmm. and and it's and it's sad because I was such an insecure young, you know, teenager. And I loved singing in high school. And then, like, you know, I had a couple friends tease me. And then I put singing on the back burner and just focused on being a producer. 
Right. And when I moved to LA, like people come up to me, it's like, that was you on face to face. I never knew that was you. I love your voice. You should sing more. Yeah. And even like when we did the sec, you know, the work the second time, Tomas was like, you really have a good voice. You, when you sing, you, you do the same, you every take, you sing it the same way. Like you're able to repeat. He's like, you should really work on doing that. So I definitely took that to heart and have been focusing on vocals a lot more. Well, yeah, you, I agree with Tomas and everyone in LA that you have a great voice, <laughs> Todd. So. Thank you. Well, like, um, like, what, like, like, I mean, we I can mean, talk more stories, but just out of curiosity, out of like, what, what was, was, like, what do people, what, everyone, no one knows anything about that punk. And I'm not asking you to reveal any secrets, but just like, what do you I think? I have the social security numbers if you Yes, could you give us our home yeah. address? No. <laughs> like, what do you think, like, what was working with him like? Like, what do people misconceive about that punk? Like, the wrong impressions are, you know, you know what is, what is, what do people have wrong about that punk? I mean, I think the, the, I don't know what really misconceptions there could be. I think people would be blown away by how humble they are. And, right, right. you know, they're, they have, there's no ego there. I mean, like, for, for such a big group and for the impact they've had on the world. And maybe that has to do with the anonymity as well. But I don't, I don't think that would just be it because you can, you know, if you have this, if you're susceptible to developing a massive ego, you're susceptible, yeah. but they honestly are the most humble guys. They, it almost would come off insecure if it wasn't like, you know, I mean, like to, that's how humble I would say they are. And I've always admired that it, it's always been about their art. You know, I right. think that's, th and that's, I guess that's a big misconception because, you know, everyone always is like, when are they going to come out with another tour? When are they going to do, like, they right. don't just do things just for the sake of doing it or, you know, oh, they're money driven. You know I mean? There's been plenty of things they could turn down regardless sure. of the price tag. I mean, that I respect, you know, I mean, most people would just like money, money, I'll take money. I'll do more. Yeah, I'm going to do it, you know? Right, right. So for them to meticulously pick what they're going to do um i think is the most respectful thing and i think and I, i'm sure that plays into even with the breakup you know that was no just that wasn't a uh, some publicity stunt sure or you know or some ploy to get people's attention there was there definitely was some meticulous reason why they decided they needed to do that you know right so. sure and so then, so then oh, that's really that's awesome. awesome. Thanks for telling yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I know nothing about them, and I've heard all sorts of like mystic stories. Like somebody booked out punk, and my friend booked out punk in Detroit, and they sent some masks to him, and like said, "Put these on your friend." That like we're not giving back the deposit, and just all sorts of dumb things. That I'm yeah, like, no, that's yeah, no, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. just some like dude from utah telling a story that <laughs> he knows about that part but um but yeah um, that's cool to hear i uh you know it's like it's easy you know i guess i always worry about what if, what people consider to be authentic when i talk about things because it's very easy to just say positive things mm -hmm. um because i've worked with them and there are you know people love them so much but i mean wholeheartedly that i do believe there's a stroke of genius there you know it's like i you know I, i've collaborated with other people and i have people that i look up to musically as well uh, but i've spent a lot of time around tomas like more so than Gima. it's like there is a certain awe even even in a in a friendship that it's hard to get rid of that like i've never felt that type of energy before from a person you know musically wow. or creatively in general mm -hmm. um it's definitely you know when people refer like people throw the word genius around quite often yeah. and very easily but i definitely believe that you know you know and like i said it's like i'm very thankful to call them friends but there is still this awestruck like you know like jesus <laughs> yeah i can imagine well i mean well let's tell the story quickly before we have to run but like about yeah, the, yeah. Next, the next time well, the fragments of time track how did that so i think you kind of stepped away from the music industry and then somehow i did reconnected yeah. they uh Grammy. Grammy. what the, the hell <laughs> the, i always say there's a fine line between the guy that's creepy living at home with his parents for way too long and a grammy award winner because like the the twist of fate that happened from jersey to california and just that it's like it was really it's it's wild you know um i they invited me you know i never got to see them perform 
their a live show. Um, they basically put that on at Coachella, invited me out to it actually, but I was in a really bad place. That was like probably, I would say, a year before I kind of took a step away from music. And, you know, I just wasn't in the in the state of mind to do it. And I regret not being able to see the show, but my reasons were valid. Um, mm -hmm. And I just kind of like went dark for, you know, and that's when I, you know, took a break and whatever. Um, but the funny thing is, obviously, I always followed what they were doing and stuff. And um, when I heard, when, you know, I was really excited with the announcement that they were doing the Tron soundtrack. Because I'm like, I love, I love film score. So anyway, what happened was I managed, I was DJing in Paris. And uh, I was backstage and I was talking to this one guy. And he's like, I have, you know, he was asking me things and we we're talking about Tron. And he's like, you know, I have Tomas's email because I didn't have his most recent email at the time. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, you know, I don't even know who this guy is, but, you know, um, he was, it was, I was DJing with Toxic Avengers. So he's part of the French, you know, type oh, scene. I forgot so, about him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so I was like, okay, I haven't, you know, it could be his, his email, whatever. So Tron came out, loved the soundtrack. So I just thought I'd send a message like, Love the soundtrack. Hope you're doing well, whatever. He writes back, and we start a dialogue. And then, like, at some point, we we do a, a Skype call. And then, you know, we talk for a while. You know, just kind of, it's like re catching up, basically, after some years. And then uh, they they had me for a meeting in New York. We were at a cafe. And Tomas begins to explain what they were trying to accomplish with RAM. And I'm sitting here nodding my ears bleeding trying to process all the deep stuff he's talking about because like I'm trying to follow. And when he's I mean, he talks so deep, it's like, I'm not an idiot. I might not be the smartest person, but I think I can absorb, but it's like, it's so deep. And it was mm -hmm. just like trying to describe this West coast sound and everything he's talking about. So I'm like, I'm on board. You know, you want me. That's that's, I'd never expected to be asked back for a second time. I figured, you know, they did this, you know, move on to the next thing. Um, you know, um, but the funny thing is, is like I went out to California, you know, they, they, they brought me out for two to three weeks, which really inspired me to move out there, to be honest, because it was just like, it felt like a movie almost, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the funny thing is, at some point that summer, because I came back, you know, I was when I was moving out to L.A., you know, Tomas said, you know, it was that email that you wrote about Tron that started the ball rolling with us asking you back to work on this album i'm like really he's like yeah well we lost touch we didn't know what happened to him like you know he's like i'm like well you could have probably just contacted my management she's like he's like no we thought it'd be best to try to do this soundtrack to get your attention which i thought was a pretty funny draw he's got a good try you know what he sense yeah about so i'm sure but, <laughs> that's, that's know, pretty amazing it, joke it's actually. just i mean but it's 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 really heartwarming to me that just the it was just a general you know, uh, sign of affection just to say great job on the soundtrack. And that one email triggered off the rest of my life. And they've been there at several, like several crucial moments in my career and in my life that really have helped beyond what, uh, what they know, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm grateful for them for, for helping your career because <laughs> I love your music too. So well, is there any questions in the chat? Should we see if I don't know if anybody's asking anything, Chris, or if uh, probably tell me to shut the hell up because I talk too much. Anyone wants to ask any questions to Todd? Um, the input is because most people talk about Tomas. Did you, did you read that one, Todd? What, what about um, Gimon? Yeah, exactly. I think. I mean the the thing about it, I would say, Tomas. I mean, it takes, you know, when you have a collaboration of any type, it's, there's always two people involved. So I think that the, you know, again, Guimon is definitely more quiet. I mean, he's obviously produces, but Tomas is the more vocal of the two. And I would say kind of guides the helm, at least from my experience with working with them. He's kind of leading, but it's not to say that his part is uh, greater than what Guy does, but, you know. I think mm -hmm. Guy is just a little more laid back in his approach and the way he does things, you know. Because, like, you know, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, when you hear stuff like uh, Starboy, mm -hmm. uh, like, that was, like, you know, Guimond's drum drumming, 
you know, I don't know if that's common knowledge, but it was just like, no, I didn't know. He heard that and he was like, I got to write to this. And that was like, that was just something he was going through, but that was one of, uh, Iman's beats, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. I think the reason that people, I mean, the funny thing is I always was a little intimidated by Iman because, you know, he was always so quiet and I, you know, it's just that person, but he's actually, he's a, you know, he's the nicest guy, but he doesn't speak, you know, at the time, especially early on, he didn't speak English as well as Tomas did. So I just uh, think he's a quiet yeah. person. So, you know. Wow. So yeah, I guess but there's that, another question from Mustache Sweat. Yes, I, I met Roman, Roman Anthony. Um, you know, it's sad that he's gone. I met, I, I got to meet him the first time I worked on Discovery with, uh, we went, we all went to Six Flags, uh, Great Adventure out in New Jersey. So, and uh, I remember that because we went on the Batman roller coaster, not that, or the Batman and Robin roller coaster, like Jets Who Forward, like really bad. And I remember <laughs> Roman Anthony had tears in his eyes afterwards, not from crying, but just from the impact of the, the g-force on the actual uh wow so, that's so he, crazy to think about you guys that's the only anecdote i have that. really for rome anthony did you get did you to try one of the helmets i probably could have there are multiple helmets at their office i i never really put one on them but i got to see them up close and stuff so and you know other things I, that was the one cool thing about going to their office when they had their office in la a lot of uh stuff from you know electromo and other things so it's like a little mm -hmm. museum within the office uh hey, another one there was something on Lule or create more i didn't actually it never got to to oh. that stage you know yeah what label was most of your work on todd my personal oh, work was over. on i records um okay. so it was a label started by my first manager out of jersey and uh basically we split and at some point i just you know decided i wanted to get my masters back so i actually bought them back at the time which was good because technically i shouldn't have had to do that but it was just kind of the most amicable thing to do and mm -hmm. it was right after ram so i was in a good position to purchase uh, a large right. right well that's cool yeah i'm surprised that, um, oh, oh, wait. how, how did was it find back then um it, it's for me it's it was never difficult i basically uh started on vinyl records like everybody else i'd go to flea markets and if it had a funky uh album cover i would get mm -hmm. it like you know you you know you tell like a disco or a funk album i'm like yeah gotta get this got to get this and then when i got bored with you know sampling from disco and r&b i went back even further to um folk music from the 60s mm -hmm. and learned about janice ian and joan Baez and James Taylor and that was even better because at the time there was it, it was very difficult to filter out drums when you were trying to right. sample music but folk music had very little drums at the time so I would be able to get these nice vocals without the, but it, it changed the the feel of the track because uh it was less soulful but it was definitely more interesting cool man that's that's I didn't know that yeah I used to always look on the personnel and it's like if there was a disco band without like a massive orchestra i was like i'm gonna buy this <laughs> i mean i like orchestral disco but not, not that was my kind of one of my tricks of finding it. at the time before you could like people everything you yeah. know that was one of my things i would do it's funny and i love orchestral disco like i love the things from like soundtracks and because the the textures when you're trying to sample a full chord it's just filled with like strings and trumpets yeah. and everything yeah. and vocals going on so i'm the opposite right yeah, yeah. I was coming more from DJ, not a. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, gotcha. Because yeah. you know, when you're playing at a yeah. bar or club, you don't want the whole like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that doesn't really work no, for a club atmosphere. It does for a sampling atmosphere. Yes, yeah, so for yeah. sure. Is there any other questions? Are we we? This is cool. this was cool to get some questions I'll, from. Them. I'll say anything. I mean, I'll talk about anything. Almost. Right. Todd, are you hungry? <laughs> oh, <laughs> always, always. Yeah. <laughs> No, man. Well, it's it's cool to see you regardless of, uh, you know, Daft Punk and music. Yes. It's good to, it's been I, such a good year. We, I enjoy our interviews. Jeff. Yeah, we did this with Toki Monster a little while yeah. ago. Yeah, exactly. That nice. was good too. So, and I appreciate you asking me on to just uh, be part of this. Oh, yeah, man. I'm, I didn't, I actually was going to play our song in the set, but I got so up tempo so fast. I, you know what? 
I'm they can go, go to Spotify and listen to it if they really yeah. want to hear it. Yeah, please so, dive with Todd Edwards. <laughs> get you there from here if you want to so, listen to our song. So, and, you know, I mean, it, I think it was fairly successful, was it not? You know, yeah. yeah. Close? I think we should do another one at some point. So, I know, would like I will, to. I would I will, like I will, to. I will uh, plant that seed right now. Okay. I'll, I'll water I'll it. Water it. <laughs> All right, well, All right, well, unless there's any other questions, let's wrap this guy up. Let's wrap All it right. up. We'll talk right. Have a good rest of the day. Yeah, good yeah, luck with your project wrapping that thing up. Thank and, you. And let's get together after quarantine. Yeah, I would love to. I'm hoping to All get right. my vaccine over the next month, so then I can come visit. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to get mine sorted, too. But <laughs> I'm low priority. But yeah, I'm well, you, you don't have any pre-existing conditions. I do, so that makes it easier for me. So. Yeah. I'll try to pick some up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, All right. everybody. Thanks, Todd. Thanks um, again. Thank you, everyone, for asking questions. Okay. And I'll see you soon, Jeff. Take care. Yeah. Bye, Todd.